Greetings in the wonderful name of the one who saved us, the Lord Jesus. Always a blessing to be with you here in Manchester, Reddish, Stockport, and Environs. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come before you as always, thanking you for who you are and what you are making us. Holy, perfect God of the universe, the God of Israel, choose us and save us, and even giving your own Son in our place giving us eternal life through him, giving us your word and your spirit and the promise of his return of the millennium of, of bliss beyond human imagination because you are a God of love for all eternity. Meet with us now, Lord God, in the power and presence of your spirit, speaking to us by your spirit through your word. Let not these things increase our knowledge with the aim of increasing our knowledge but increasing our knowledge, making us more conform to the image and likeness of your Son, Amen. the one who saved us. In his name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Before we turn to the Old Testament, very briefly, can we look please at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 12. Now I mean this. Each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am Cephas. I am of Christ. There's something in human nature, even as Christians, that they want to latch on to a man. To put a man or a leader on a pedestal. Paul was complaining about this. Right from the beginning in the early church, it was there fan clubs. There are certain cultures, like in India, that lend themselves to this. You'll see people saved out of Hinduism, they replace the Brahmin or the Guru with the pastor. He's the man. You see this in Hasidic Judaism. It's not what the Word of God says, it's what the Rebbe says, the Tzaddik. He's the man. You see this, you see this in Africa with the Sangormas and witch doctors. The same mentality, the witch doctor is the guy, well, when people are saved out of that tribalism in Africa, this becomes transferred onto the pastor. He's the man. <laughs> they begin looking to a man. It's something in the human condition. But like with everything else, God uses Israel and the Jews to teach us about the human condition. There are microcosm of humanity, as I always point out. Other nations, other people will behave in the same character as Israel and the Jews. Paul tells us this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He says, these things were written, the history of Israel, so you wouldn't make the same mistakes. But, you know, you read the epistle of James. James basically tells them, you adulteresses, you're doing the same thing as your forefathers. James was writing to Jews who believed. You know, Hebrews, we see the same thing. And we see it in Corinthians. Christians are fully capable of doing the same kind of things. I am of Cephas, I am of Apollos, I am of Paul, I am of Jacob Prash, I am of Tony Pierce, I am of Arnold Fruchtenbaum. We get fan clubs. <laughs> I get this stuff, emails, Jacob said, yeah, big deal. <laughs> There's something about people that like to do but this is not to say by the grace of God he does not choose certain people for certain tasks at certain times. And if God blesses you through someone, if God blesses you through an evangelist and you got saved through a particular evangelist and God has used that evangelist, well, praise God, but that's just the grace of God in that evangelist. It's not that evangelist. If you go through a difficult time in your life as a Christian, and God uses a particular pastor or a pastor and his wife in your life to encourage you and help you work through something, well, praise God for that pastor. But that's just the grace of God in that pastor. If you get some teaching that encourages you or clarifies things in your mind or helps you in your Christian life, well, you praise God for that teacher, but <coughs> it's only God's grace. We're all the same. We're all a big zero. <laughs> the greatest of you shall be the least. But there's something in the human condition that wants to 
book for people. Well, it becomes inevitable. Invariably, when people do that, and a lot of Christians do it, at some point, they're going to be very disappointed in their hero. <laughs> the scripture is not hagiographic. The scripture doesn't talk about the men of God the way the Koran does. They don't mythologize these people as going around with halos. Right from the beginning, it shows you Abraham's sin and his weakness. The sins of Isaac and Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It shows you their weakness and their sin. The greatest leader of Israel, King David. It shows you terrible sin. You come to the New Testament. Even after the resurrection, Paul challenges Peter in the presence of all. Barnabas gets caught up in the hypocrisy with the circumcision of Gentiles. And he tells, tells them off and all this stuff. Paul says, wretched man that I am. You're going to be very disappointed in your guru. <laughs> You're going to be very disappointed in your leader. You're going to be very disappointed in your rabbi. You're going to be very disappointed in your witch doctor. And some of these hyper-Pentecostal pastors are only witch doctors. <laughs> they even sell what we call in Africa, muti. Remember the Holy Ghost miracle cloths to take away debt, selling 25 pounds to unemployed families. A televangelist actually did that in this country. Unbelievable! You're going to be very disappointed. Amen. But it's much more sinister than that. Let's look at the quintessential example. Go with me, please. Back to 1 Samuel. Chapter 8. Israel demands a king. Israel demands a king. Well, God told him right from the beginning, this was a bad idea. Liturgically, the Hebrew Siddur, the prayer book, prefaces most Hebrew prayers, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe. Yahweh was to be viewed as king. Messiah was to be viewed as king. But people, in verse 5, appoint the king for us to judge us like the nations. But the king was displeasing in the sight of Samuel when they said, give us a king. And he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said, listen to the voice of the people. In regard to all that they say to you, for they've not rejected you, but they've rejected me from being king over them. They were to look at Yahweh as king. <clears throat> if there's a leader, a senior pastor, or whatever, he's only the prime minister. You always see this in Old Testament typology. There was the king, but then there was Mordecai. Did. Usurping the place of God. Now this is the spirit of Antichrist. This is the spirit of Antichrist. Israel, one day, is going to say, once again, give us a king. Having rejected the Messiah, the king of the Jews, having rejected Yeshua, they're going to get another king. They're going to get Sodom and Mashiach. They will make a covenant with the Antichrist. He's going to betray them. They're going to find out what happened to them. He'll sell them down the river immediately. He's going to set them up and try to wipe them out, and he will wipe out two-thirds of them. Jesus will come back and intervene and save the remnant of Israel, but... Give us a king. Give us a guru. Give us a witch doctor. Give us a rabbi. We want somebody to latch on to. When you see people doing that, it's either A, ignorance, or B, there's something wrong in their own relationship with Jesus. That's right, that's right. You're looking to a man instead of to him. That's right. I've always told people, you can follow me to the exact extent I'm following him. <laughs> you could agree with me to the exact extent I agree with this. <laughs> you can trust me to the precise extent I'm trusting Jesus. <laughs> Don't follow me. 
follow the one I'm following as long as I'm following him. <laughs> and if I stop following him, God forbid, you follow him anyway. But there's something about people. They're always looking for some kind of a messiah, a savior, a king, a leader. A lot of this has to do with not wanting to take personal responsibility for their own lives spiritually. Amen. It's easier to get somebody to tell them what to do and what to believe. <laughs> it's quite a thing. You know, somebody else take responsibility. I've got a few health issues. My cardiologist is telling me to cut back on travel. <coughs> my dentist is telling me to cut back on sweets. I've been telling people, my psychiatrist is trying to persuade me to give up Russian roulette, you know. <laughs> it's always easier to get somebody else to tell you what to do, when in fact you're perfectly capable of knowing those things yourself. <laughs> but you need a seal of approval here. <laughs> That's just the way it is. Give us a king! When you see people saying, give us a king, there's more to it than wanting a king. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The centrality of the place of the Lord in their life is not what it should be. Mm -hmm. They're looking for an alternative or a substitute, in a sense, even though they may not realize it. They're looking to defray personal responsibility for themselves, or from themselves. But there's even a sinister element to it, prophetically and eschatologically. This is going to point to Antichrist, to give us a king. You see this? The, the, the people look for a political guru. They look for an economic guru. That's how people follow dictators. They think there's going to be some strong man going to solve everything. Well, that's the mentality of the world. Unless a nation turns to God, it doesn't matter who its leaders are going to be. It's like the book of Kings and Chronicles. The reason we have corrupt men in Washington and in Whitehall is because nations get the leaders they deserve, same as the book of Kings and Chronicles. Why do we have these terrible governments? <laughs> it's the governments that nations deserve. When nations turn against God, when you're reporting babies and having same-sex marriage, what are you going to get leaders are going to do? This? Godless nations will get godless leaders. But when that gets into the church, we've got a problem. The world, what can we do about it? But when it gets into the church, what are we going to do about it? Now, even when these leaders go off, even when they go off for his own glory and for the good of his people, God will still continue to use them up to a point. You might not like the prime minister. You might not like the president. You might. The scripture says pray for them anyway. Yeah, man. If these crooked politicians are not being influenced by our prayers, and they're still crooked politicians, if these people are not being influenced by our prayers, they're going to be influenced by something demonic. Read the book of Daniel. If they're not influenced, whether you like them or not, no matter what party they are, if they're not influenced by our prayers, they're going to be influenced by something demonic. Pray for them anyway, even if you don't like them. But in the church, it's the same. For his own glory and for the good of his people, God will still use leaders who may not even be backsliders up to a point. <coughs> In chapter 10, is Saul among the prophets. <coughs> By this point, he'd really gone off. But he was prophesying. And I have seen this so many times. Oh, but he prophesied. Oh, but somebody was healed. <laughs> oh, but he speaks in tongues. That's supposed to be the proof of their pudding. But we've said it 10,000 times. Do you know them by their gifts or do you know them by their fruit? Matthew 7, 22. Many will come in that day and say, Lord, we did these miracles. and we It's soul among the prophets. Now, if somebody is exercising a charismatic gift of the Spirit faithfully, it may be an indication that they're faithful. It may be an indication that they're faithful, but it's not the proof of the pudding by any means. But we've made it the proof of the pudding. That's the way the world thinks. That's the way tribal Africans think about 
which not this. That's the way Hindus think about gurus. That's the way Roman Catholics think about popes. They look for the stuff. We should not be like that. Well, like anything else, be careful what you ask for. You might get it. <coughs> Make sure you know what you're asking for. Make sure you understand the full implications of it potentially. You might get it. And Israel got more than they bargained for. And having rejected the true Messiah, they will look for another one. And they will get it. And as Daniel makes clear, they're going to get more than they bargained for. Nonetheless, he's confirmed. Where do things first go wrong? Look with me, please, to 1 Samuel chapter 13. 9, so Saul said, bring to me the burnt offerings and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offerings. And it came about as soon as he finished offering the burnt offerings, that behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him and to greet him. But Samuel said, why have you done? What have you done? And he said, because I saw the people were scattering from me, that you did not come within the appointed days, and that the Philistines were assembling at Mishmash. Therefore I said, now the Philistines will come down at me at Gilgal, and I have not asked the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was not from the tribe of Levi. He was not of Aaronic descent. He was not a Kohen, a priest. It was not for him to function in this way. It was not his calling. He operated out of his calling. Out of fear of the people being scattered. And under pressure of circumstances. The way the devil seduces a leader into doing this, it does not begin with selfish ambition. It begins with, I'm going to lose my ministry. I'm going to lose people from my church. And then, the pressures that will come on any pastor or any leader, instead of waiting on the Lord and trusting the Lord, they act in the flesh. That's how it begins. If he, mm -hmm. if he can't get them to do it out of selfish ambition initially, he'll do it with pressure and a fear of the people being scattered, of mm -hmm. losing numbers, things like that. This is the first sign that you're heading for trouble. You'll see the same pattern in these kinds of leaders. But today, I don't want to primarily talk about these kinds of leaders. I want to talk about our leaders. I want to talk about Jacob Prash and about Roy and about Arnold and about the kinds of people we would listen to. I want to look out for these things in myself. It's easy to identify these patterns in other people. It's not so easy to identify these things in ourselves. First sign to look at. They act outside of their calling and gifting. When you see somebody acting outside of their calling and gifting, look out. Not to throw mud, but it's public knowledge. Jimmy Swaggart was a gifted evangelist. And he had quite a music ministry. Quite a music ministry. God blessed him, God used him. No question about it. No, a lot of people got saved through him in the early decades of his ministry. We all know about the moral scandals that beset him and the things surrounding it which were very ugly. I'm convinced the first place he went off and he became a pastor and he said or misrepresented himself as some kind of a prophet and theologian. 
He debated the Muslim, Ahmed did that. And he lost the debate. He was not the right person to take on Didat. You should have stuck to what God called him to do. Amen. I knew a pastor in New York. Except he wasn't a pastor, he was a church pastor. Once that church was planted, it was doing well in the early days. It was really doing well. Evangelism, they were rescuing prostitutes from pimps, you know, these runaway girls and stuff from abused families. Homeless people, and they, they would do it. I mean, they had a, a humongous, it was a showcase for contemporary Christian music at the time, before music ministry turned into an industry. It was really good. But he liked New York, and he decided he would be the pastor. Now, what he should have done is go to some other city and planted another church. <laughs> but he stuck around, and everything he built went down the tubes, but then so did his marriage and his family, and his personal life. I'm convinced <laughs> this is the first sign you see of trouble. If you see it in yourself, you're heading for trouble. Every one of us is a minister. Not every one of us is a leader, <coughs> but every one of us has a ministry. Even with right motives, good people can be motivated by the need instead of by the Lord. Yeah. It's so easy with right motives. I'm not necessarily saying it begins with a wrong motive. <laughs> and the devil knows that. Then there's the pressure of the people. <coughs> and they step outside of their gifting and fall. As I always point out, when somebody steps outside of their gifting and calling, expect two things to happen. The first thing is, they fail at what they're not called to do. They will fail at what they're not called to do. But secondly, they will fail at what they are called to do. That's a tragedy. That's a tragedy. They get diverted from what they are called to do. That's quite a thing. I had a dear friend who was a gifted evangelist. Some of you knew him. Many people were saved through his ministry in the South Pacific. Many. When he stuck to preaching the gospel, he was good. When he got into trying to be a prophecy Bible teacher, he went into all these conspiracy the theories, and he made himself an object of public ridicule, ultimately climaxing with the Y2K fiasco. Don't do this! Don't do it! This gift thing. Personal tragedy beset his life. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I said to look. Jesus said to make converts, not disciples. No, he said to make disciples, not converts. You'll, you say you'll go to any place that will give you a platform to preach the gospel. So what did Jesus warn about? The Pharisees go to the ends of the earth to make one convert, then they become twice as much a son of hell as they used to be. You're leading people to Christ and putting them in, in these lunatic churches with these crazy doctrines? I'm just called to preach the gospel and prepare the church for the last days. Well, if you're called to preach the gospel, you're called to make disciples, put the people in churches where they're going to be taught the word of God. Again, as always, evangelism minus discipleship equals zero. Prepare the church for the last days. Where does the scripture talk about the Illuminati and Freemasonry to be obsessed with that stuff? And why, why don't you concentrate on what it's... Amen. Amen. The church warns about deception against the elect. Why don't you look at that stuff? Now, it's fine to be aware of the Illuminati. It's fair to be aware of that stuff, but you're obsessed with it. <coughs> well, his daughter, his own daughter, went to a church that was teaching the hyper faith. Just claim the healing. Just, you know, just... She developed a disease when they were missionaries in the South Pacific, a tropical disease, an infectious disease, and the virus became dormant and resurged in adult life after her husband was tragically killed in a scuba diving accident. He was a nice guy. And left with a little baby, and she went into clinical depression, and this infectious disease she had pediatrically resurfaced. They didn't even know what it was. They found the diagnosis some years later in Los Angeles. It took years to even get a diagnosed. But it came back, and she was in this church, and they just claimed the healing. And when she didn't get healed, the condemnation is because you don't have any faith. Yeah. Yeah. She 
goes out and hangs herself. A famous evangelist daughter hangs herself, leaving a little baby. Now do you see why I told you don't put people in those churches? I didn't say it to him that way. Because I liked him and I respected him and I didn't want to add to his grief. But that's what it came to. When somebody gets out of their calling and gifting, that's the first sign they're heading for trouble. What's the next sign? Let's look at chapter 14 of 1 Samuel, please. Now the men of Israel, in verse 24, were hard-pressed on that day, for Saul had put the people under an oath, saying, Cursed be the man who eats food before evening until I have avenged myself and my enemies. So none of the people tasted food, and the people of the land entered the forest, and there was honey on the ground. And when the people entered the forest, there was a flow of honey. But no man put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. But Jonathan, his own son, had not heard when his father put the people under the oath. So he put out the end of his staff that was in his hand, and he dipped it in the honeycomb, and he put his hand to his mouth, and his eyes brightened. Then one of the people answered and said, Your father strictly put the people under oath saying, Cursed be the man who eats food today, and the people were weary. And Jonathan said, My fathers troubled the land. See now how my eyes have been brightened, because I tasted of a little honey. How much more, if only the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies, which they found. For now the slaughter among the Philistines has not been great. When we did the teaching on the grain offering, that was some time ago, we talked about the typology of honey. In Proverbs, have you found honey, eat what you need. Don't have it in excess of honey, but eat what you need. People need honey. God coated the manna with honey. It's sweet. Just like Ezekiel and John, the word of God is making bitter in the stomach, but it's sweet in the mouth. There's always a combination of bitter and sweet in the Christian life until the Lord comes. Then it will all be a land of milk and honey. And everything will be easy, easy, and sweet. Right now, we're sojourning and we're in a war. But even soldiers in battle need a little entertainment and recreation once in a while. Don't withhold the honey! Don't withhold the honey. Give the people the honey. He had no biblical mandate or right to put such a decree on the people. When you don't give the people the honey, they're going to go and get something they shouldn't. God created people to need honey. It's not good for man to be alone. Man was made for woman. Well, Amen. It's no wonder Paul says mandatory celibacy is a doctrine of demons. Mm. Roman Catholic priests and nuns. <laughs> the teaching a doctrine of demons in that church. So you can't have a husband, you can't have a wife, they go out and they find a little kid, they find an older boy. <laughs> no wonder Paul said it's a doctrine of demons. <clears throat> to make matters worse, the Eastern Rite of the Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern, they, they had the Greek Orthodox liturgy, but they're under the Pope. When the Crusades invaded the East to get control of the spice trade, they told the Eastern Orthodox, if you come back under the Pope, you can keep the Greek language and liturgy, and you can even keep your wives. Just come back under the Pope. So to this day, the Eastern Rite of the Roman Catholic Church lets their priests marry, and they don't have much pedophilia, but the Latin Rite doesn't. Not only that, but now the Anglicans, the High Church Anglicans, are telling them, you can come and be a Roman Catholic priest. We'll ordain you as a Roman Catholic priest. You can keep your wife. Some of them can, some of them can't. But it's all based on politics. <laughs> Theocratic politics. It's not based on the Word of God. Yeah. You deny the honey, people are going to go do something. They withhold the honey. Ezekiel warns about this in chapter 34. With force and severity, you've dominated them. You've heard me point out, we don't know who the Nicolaitans were. There are different theories, but we know what the word means. Nicolaity, 
suppression of the people. He hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. The colloquialism we use for this is one you've all heard. Heavy. They begin acting outside of their gifting and calling, and then they get into the heavy shepherding. They don't give the people any honey. It's always manipulation, condemnation, guilt, no encouragement, nothing sweet. Not, not. There's a balance. Remember Proverbs, not too much honey. There are churches that will never address doctrinal error, that will never warn the sheep against the wolves. They just want to give honey. They just want the Joel Austin thing. Is homosexuality wrong? They asked him on CNN. I don't know about that. I just know God loves everybody. <laughs> just the honey. Too much honey will make you sick. Even girls hate mushy poetry. <laughs> what do you need? There's always going to be a balance. Once you see those two things, the stage has been set. In Hebrew, we have two basic words for sin. Chet and Pesha. Chet is missing the target. Or you might translate it, not going far enough. Pesha is going too far. There are sins of omission and commission, loosely translated into Greek, hamartino and hamarteno. Chet and Pesha. When somebody backslides, when anybody backslides, backsliding does not begin with doing something we shouldn't do. <coughs> backsliding begins with failing to do the things we should. It begins with sins of omission. If somebody becomes deficient in their prayer life or the scripture reading or fellowshipping with other believers, if they stop witnessing, it's only a matter of time. Once we stop doing what we should do, it's only a matter of time, and usually not that long of a time, before we wind up doing things we shouldn't. Well, now this can be done in ignorance sometimes. It seems a burut. It's referred to, it's in Leviticus, but it's referred to in Hebrews, the sins of ignorance. Nonetheless, failing to do the things we should. Chapter 15 in 1 Samuel, Samuel said to Saul, The Lord has sent me to anoint you king over his people of Israel. Listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts. Now the term host there is tzavaot from the Hebrew word army, tzava. When you see the Lord of hosts, it has something to do with spiritual war. We translated hosts. It would technically, more accurately, be translated from Hebrew as armies. <coughs> I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel and how he set himself against him on the way while he was coming up from Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all he has. Do not spare him, but put to death both man and woman, child and infant, ox, sheep, and donkey. We have to understand the nature of Benjamin. I apologize to those who know this. The history of Israel all the way to the end of the age, all the way to the book of Revelation, chapter 7 and chapter 14, are predicated on Jacob's prophecy to the 12 tribes to his sons in Genesis 49. You'll see the tribes behaving in the character of Jacob's prophecy, but it's not just for them. It comes into play again when the time of the Gentiles is over in the book of Revelation, and the age of the church is closed, and God turns his purposes back to Israel and the Jews, you'll see with the 144,000, the 12 tribes in that, in Revelation, it all goes back to Genesis 49. When we read about Benjamin, King Saul being from the tribe of Benjamin, it's <coughs> conspicuous what Jacob prophesied in verse 27 of Genesis 49. Benjamin, Benjamin, son of the right hand, is a ravenous wolf. In the morning he devours the prey, but in the evening he divides the spoil. 
Benjamin always begins bad, badly, but ends good. Benjamin's character is to begin bad, but to repent, to turn around and become good. Like you'll divide the booty with the strong, Isaiah 53. It becomes something good. The early Christians applied this to Rabbi Shaul of Tarsus, Paul the Apostle. He began as a persecutor of the church from the tribe of Benjamin, but he became the apostle to the Gentiles. That's the nature of Benjamin. Well, Saul failed to get rid of Amalek. Centuries later, uh, Haman comes, an Amalekite, an Agagite, a direct descendant of Amalek and tries to wipe the Jews out in ancient Persia in the book of Esther. Now notice something. What Amalek did in the days of Moses was hundreds of years before Saul. And what Haman did was hundreds of years after the time of Saul. Ancient enemies always remain enemies. Because Saul failed to get rid of Amalek, it had to be somebody from the same tribe Mordechai and Esther, who did get rid of him. You understand? Mm -hmm. Benjamin always begins badly, but ends good. What happens? It's quite a thing. Hundreds of years later, ancient enemies will always be our enemies. We're not talking about the people as individuals, but the people as a group. Okay. Islam will always be the enemy of Christianity. Islam is a religion of peace. We have to be one. This is all lies. This is all Christian. It's all lies of the devil. Talk to the Christians in Nigeria, what's happening with Boko Haram. Talk to the Christians anywhere in the Middle East or anywhere in Asia where you have Islam. See the religion of peace. It's a big lie. And it's not only politicians and left-wing academics telling the lie. There's people in pulpits telling that lie. Yeah. Yeah. It'll always be the enemy of Christianity. Roman Catholicism will always be the enemy of biblical Christianity. Not against Roman Catholics, but Catholicism will always be the enemy of the true gospel. Talmudic Judaism, the Judaism of the rabbis up in Presswich, will always be the enemy of Messianic Judaism, of Jews who believe. It will always be the enemy of believing Jews. Ancient enemies remain our enemies. You can reach out to individuals within those communities and they can be saved. Mm -hmm. But the communities themselves as corporate entities will always be our opponents. There is no peace. No peace with Amalek. Go strike him! Verse 4, then Saul summoned the people and numbered them in Tenaim, 200,000 foot soldiers, 10,000 men of Judah. Saul came to the city of Amalek and set an ambush in the valley, and Saul said to the Kenites, Go depart, go down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to the sons of Israel when they came up from Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. Notice the distinction among the Gentiles. God makes a distinction between the Gentile nations that blessed Israel and the Gentile nations that cursed Israel. This goes back to Genesis 12, God's promise to Abraham, reiterated through Jacob. God's judgment would have come on the United States a long time ago. One of the, one of the reasons God's judgment has not come on the United States a long time ago is because the United States has treated Israel better than, and Jews better than other nations. Otherwise, God's judgment. That's one of the main reasons God's judgment is not fall on America. God will always make a distinction between Gentile nations who bless his people and those who curse his people. Now this also applies to the church. This also applies to the church, but it begins with Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The Kenites, uh, Caleb was a Kenite. Moses' uh, deputy was a Kenite. It was never on the basis of race. It was always on the basis of faith. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go. Let's continue. So Saul defeated the Amalekites from Habilah as you go to Shur, which is east of Egypt. This is like... Uh, along the border between the Sinai and the Negev. And he captured Agog, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agog and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good. 
and were not willing to destroy them utterly. They were not willing, but everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I regret I've made Saul king. He's turned his back from following me. Now that term, and turned his back in Hebrew, means backslide. He's not carried out my commands. And Samuel was distressed and cried out to the Lord. And Samuel went early in the morning to meet Saul. And he came to Saul to Mount Carmel. And we'll come back to verse 12 in a moment. Third, he fails to do what God commanded. His going to the witch of Endor, trying to murder David, killing Abiatar the high priest, the stuff that God said don't do, that came later. His backsliding began by failing to do what God said he should do. That's going to be true in anybody's life. Lord forbid. But look. He looked for something good in Amalek. Oh, there's good things! I see evangelical leaders saying garbage. We can learn from Islam. Mm, we can no, learn no, no from way. Roman Catholicism. No, there's no, things we... Well, the scripture says there may be good <coughs> things in it. There may be good things in it. It says this. It says... <laughs> that he kept the good things. What did he keep the good things for? Agog the king, the Melchizedek, lay, he utterly destroyed all the people with the sword, but he kept the best. He kept all that was good in verse 9. Anything that's good in Agog is only camouflage. To ensnare you. Don't look for anything good in Talmudic Judaism or in Islam or Mormonism or the Church of Rome. Don't look for any. There may be good things, but it's camouflage. That's right. <laughs> Remember, Second Peter, Parasolzusin, false teachers and false prophets put truth next to error. That's right. God hates the mixture. Laodicea. You've got the hot springs coming down from Pamukkala and the cold springs. But with the two mixed, the water is lukewarm. What does Jesus say to do with the lukewarm? Oh, we're going to chew the meat and spit out the bones. That's not how it works. It's putting milk in tea and say, I'm going to swallow the tea and spit out the milk. It's homogenous, homogeneous. It doesn't work. Compromise with Amalek. They go down the ecumenical route. They look for the common ground. Interfaith. What happens next when he's confronted? Look at that verse 12. Saul came to Carmel and behold he set up a monument for himself. Now we see what's really happening. <laughs> when you see this happening, somebody has acted out of their gifting. They gravitate towards heavy shepherding and they begin compromising with things the Word of God says is wrong, they are no longer building the kingdom of God. They are setting up a monument to themselves. They are building their own empire and hanging God's name on it. They're using the name of Jesus to build their own kingdom, not His. They set up monuments to self. Very often this is expressed in modern times through building programs. If God says get a building, get a building. If he says get a thousand buildings, get a thousand buildings, if God so says. 
see these people? They're building monuments to themselves. Let's look. Verse 14, Samuel comes to him, and right away, Blessed are you of the Lord, I carried out the command of the Lord. They begin to protest that they did God's will. They try to preempt the situation. But Samuel says, what is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears? And the lowing of the oxen which I hear. I did the Lord's will! <laughs> yeah, what's that? Led Zeppelin? <laughs> And Saul said, they brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep, the oxen, to sacrifice to the Lord. But the rest we've utterly destroyed. Notice, blame the people. Religious Narcissism. They'll never accept the ramifications of their own actions. They'll never accept culpability for their own decisions. When a leader goes down this way, he's going to blame the congregation. It's the people's fault! <laughs> well, I grant you, people get the leaders they deserve. That's true of nations, it's true of churches. But so goes the shepherd, so goes the sheep. They will never accept personal culpability for their own mistakes. Now understand this. King David was fully capable of doing things as depraved and wrong as Saul. They both were effectively murderers. They both were immoral. They both did unspeakable things. A good king like David did things that were just as bad as Saul. But when David repented, he repented. When he numbered the people, he said, Lord, blame me. Don't blame the people. This is my fault. Quite a thing. That's a scary thing, that a good leader like David is capable of doing things just as treacherous as Saul. <laughs> Jacob Pash is capable of doing things just as treacherous as Benny Hinn or Morris Cirillo. I'm sorry to tell you that, but he's capable of it. That he who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. If somebody doesn't think they're capable of it, if they think they're immune from it, they're heading to do it. More than likely. David was not a religious narcissist. Oh, he absolutely blew it. But his repentance was sincere. God restored him. But let's look. And Samuel said to Saul, Wait, let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said, Speak. Unlike myself, Saul sought the Lord before he spoke. He didn't just shoot his mouth off in his anger. <laughs> And Samuel said, Is it not true, though you were little in your own eyes, you were made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed you king over Israel. And that word anointed, Mishchal, is where you get the word Messiah, Moshiach. And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are exterminated. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord, but rushed upon the spoil and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord? They rush upon the spoil. What was motivating him? Tangible assets. <laughs> Follow the money. When somebody begins building their own kingdom instead of God's, always follow the money. They're thinking like the world. They behave like the world. 
They'll have the same priorities as the world. Follow the money. They're no longer building God's kingdom. They're building their own. When people are building their own kingdom, it's always about money. Follow the money. They pursue the assets. At the expense of truth. Well, you know why I quit Revelation TV when they brought the money preachers in? Not only me, so did Paul Wilkinson from here in Manchester, so did Bob Mitchell, there are others who quit. We quit in protest over them bringing in the money preachers. Well, now you saw last week it's announced Charities Commission is investigating them for fraud. The judgment will always come where the sin is. <laughs> that's about money. That's what they let these money preachers on. That's what is, well, that's what's happening. I'm not gossip, it's on the internet, it's in the newspapers. Charities Commission is going after them. Unbelievable. Well, it is believable. They have a financial motive. They're going for the spoil! What happens? Verse 20, then Saul said to Samuel, I did obey the voice of the Lord and went on the mission in which he sent me. And I brought back Agog, the king of Amalek, and utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took some of the spoil of the sheep and oxen, the choices of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord God at Gilgal. They persist in the narrative. They persist in the narrative. Blame the people and protest your own innocence. They persist in the narrative. That's what a narcissist will always do. Especially a religious narcissist. But let's look further about religious narcissism. And Samuel said in verse 22, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Because to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For the rebellion is as the sin of divination. Can be translated witchcraft, the Hebrew term makshafut. And insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he's rejected you from being king. What does Saul do? They do what they always do. They do what they do now. They cover up the iniquity with religious fanfare. They have big praise <laughs> Today we call it Hillsong. I had a couple of musicians from Hillsong from Darling Czech's band came to hear me speak in Sydney, Australia. In, in July, they told me what was really going on in that place and what it was. I, I, I believed them. I, I know they were telling me the truth. It's, it's, it's absolutely sickening. Mm -hmm. Of course, they were under investigation too for the pedophilia. They won't cover it up with big religious hands. They sing louder. You know the, you know the drill. They call it worship, but it's entertainment. Mm -hmm. They call it anointing, but it's hype. Mm -hmm. It's all fan fan religiosity. God does not delight in it. Put things right. Strange fire. Yeah, strange fire. But then it calls his insubordination, witchcraft, <coughs> idolatry. It was much later that he actually went to the witch at Endor. It was much later that he actually ventured into the occult overtly. But people don't do something like that 
on a lark or instantaneously, it was already in his heart. Whenever there is an absence of true spirituality, of, of scriptural spirituality, people will try to substitute that with a counterfeit spirituality. That's what witchcraft and the occult are. Counterfeit spirituality. Metaphysical. Mysticism. They will substitute it with a counterfeit spirituality. But long before he went to the witch of Endor, God saw what was already there. It was only a matter of time before he'd go to the witch of Endor. Because God wasn't going to speak to him anymore. Then Saul said to Samuel, I've sinned, I've indeed transgressed the command of the Lord and your words because I feared the people and listened to their voice. Now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. Oh boy. When they can't get out of it. When it's the Bill Clinton thing. I did not have sex with that woman. <laughs> I smoked cannabis, but I didn't inhale. <laughs> when they do the Bill Clinton thing, and then they get nailed and can't get out of it, it becomes about saving face. <coughs> False repentance. All right, all right, Samuel, I admit I was wrong. I did it because of the people. Don't blame me. But please, please, come back with me. Don't let the people see what's really happening. I fear the people. I listened to that. I shouldn't have. I should have listened to the Lord instead of the people. I'm sorry I read the Purpose Driven Life. <laughs> Therefore, part of my sin and come back with me. <coughs> They're always willing to repent on their terms. <coughs> to save their neck, their image, their position. Not David. That's not what you read in Psalm 51. That's not what David did when he numbered the people and the consequences fell on the nation. That's not what David did. They always play the same game. Oh, well, Todd Bentley left his wife and his children and went off with another woman. Now she's prophesying. Don't you believe in grace? Yeah, I also believe in repentance. He's living in whoredom. He's in an adulterous marriage. What about his handicapped wife we abandoned and their three kids? Don't they count? Oh, you don't believe in love. You're judgmental. It's not my judgment. It's what God says. Don't you love his wife and kids? <clears throat> Unbelievable. It's worse by the day. False repentance. They don't put things right. They just want to preserve the status quo. Oh, but God forgave David and he returned to his ministry. No, he didn't. First of all, that was the Torah. We're under the New Covenant. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. But secondly, it's a completely false comparison. Mm -hmm. David was from the tribe of Judah. Judah. The priests were from the tribe of Levi. Levi. Mm -hmm. David was never restored to ministry. Mm -hmm. David was never in ministry. It was a political office. It was not a clergy office. He was never in ministry. It's a completely false comparison that only ignorant people would believe. They'll repent on their terms in order to preserve the status quo. <coughs> but then what happened? But Samuel said to Saul in verse 26, I'll not return with you. You've rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord's rejected you from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned to go, Saul sees the end of his robe, and it tore. What would later happen? 
with David in the cave of Ein Gedi. Remember? He's been torn away from you. You tried to hold him back, but it's torn away from you. I'm getting it's cut the edge. I'm getting the kingdom. I could have killed you now. It's not my place to do that. I let you live. You're going to deal with an enemy far more dangerous than me, so you're going to deal with the Lord. I've got the swatch of fabric to prove it. That's the pattern. They act outside of their gifting and calling. And the heavy shepherding. They withhold the honey, the guilt and the condemnation. I don't mean the righteous rebuke or correction. <clears throat> and they compromise with Amalek. They look for common ground with false religions. Because they're setting up a monument to themselves. They're no longer in the ministry for the Lord or for the people. They're in the ministry for them. Then is the religious narcissism. It's everybody's fault but theirs. They've got a financial motive. They're going for the spoil. And they're willing to compromise truth and righteousness to get it. That's what Revelation TV did. They knew that stuff was wrong. Then they cover it up with religious fanfare. And when they repent, it is an abject repentance. It's all cosmetic. It's all spin. To employ a modern colloquialism, it is all about public relations. It's not about the relationship with God. Now this is a familiar pattern. <clears throat> I and probably you have seen this a number of times in a number of churches. We've seen this pattern with major Christian leaders. We've seen this pattern with local pastors. I think most of us who have been Christians any time have experienced this or at least seen it probably more than once. To make matters worse, even the world has seen it because it tends to get in the media if they're high profile enough. But you know, I'm not worried. I'm not too concerned about Revelation TV or about the tele-evangelists or about these pastors of megachurches that keep falling off the parapet. I'm worried about Jacob Crash. I'm worried about Roy. I'm worried about me, and I'm concerned about you. If it happened to them, it can happen to us. You want a king? You've already got one. Do yourself a big favor. Don't look in my direction. If by his unmerited grace God blesses me and uses me in your life, praise God. If he can speak through Jacob Prashi, well, let's say it this way. If he can speak through Balaam's donkey, he can speak through Jacob Prashi. One jackass is good as another. <laughs> but that's all it is, is grace. Give us a king. You look for a king, he's going to let you down. Yeah. Yeah. Even the best, even David. Yeah. You look for a king, he's going to let you down. You want a king? Good. I want a king too. Praise God, we already have one. Yeah. And his name is not Jacob. His name is not Arnold. His name is not Roy. His name, of course, is Jesus Yeshua. God bless. We have some recorded materials. I think a few folks left outside.